In nature, a seemingly random sequence of events can destroy something that has taken a long time to build. Sometimes these things can never be restored to the way they were, no matter how much we want them to. As an example, let's imagine that the wind is blowing and it causes a small twig to fall from a tree on the side of a hill. The twig falls onto the pebble that was holding the stone in place. The stone was the only thing that prevented an avalanche of boulders at the top of the hill that would have swept away the city below. My name is Robbie Patrick. Not Rob, not Bob or Bert, just Robbie. And this series of seemingly random events is very similar to what destroyed my happy marriage. My wife Carly and I are typical double income no kids. We have a nice house in the suburbs of Detroit. We both have great jobs and life is great. We have still decided not to fulfill our duty to procreate out of pure selfishness. We thought we had our whole lives ahead of us to have children later. So for now, we were busy packing our toys, traveling to exotic places, and just having fun with each other. I'm 5'10", weigh 170 pounds, have dark brown hair and eyes, quite attractive, and in great shape from running 50 to 70 miles a week. I usually run a couple of marathons a year, so I like to stay in shape. Carly, the apple of my eye, is about five feet tall and weighs 160 pounds. She has shoulder-length blonde hair and sparkling blue eyes. Have you heard about people whose smile can light up a room? Well, Carly's smile can light up an entire city. She has fairly small breasts, so most of her 160 pounds are on her hips, thighs, and butt. About a year ago, Carly noticed she had a little baby bump. It didn't bother me at all. I even thought it was cute. But she was upset about it for a couple of days until I suggested that she get rid of it by going out for a run with me. She initially loved the idea and even bowed herself a bunch of nice running clothes and three pairs of running shoes. But the implementation of the idea was much less successful. Okay, why embellish it? We weren't compatible running-wise. The two of us running together was as good as a fart in church. If I slowed down so much that it looked like I was running backwards, it was still too fast for Carly. If she sped up to the point where she could only run for a couple of minutes, it was still too slow for me to be comfortable. However, the answer was found quite quickly. On our second and final run together, we noticed a group of six or seven women running together. Carly let me run on my own while she joined them. A few weeks later, as summer arrived, Carly's running group decided to switch to morning runs to avoid the summer heat. I stuck to my evening schedule except for long runs on Sunday morning. It suited us perfectly, or so I thought. Our normal routine was that Carly would wake up at 5.30 a.m., leave the house at 5.45, run with the girls, and return between 7 and 7.20. She did this three times a week, usually on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. I usually went out right after her, bought her favorite coffee at Tim Hortons with a donut or bagel and sometimes flowers, and waited for her to return. I also ironed her clothes for work and made sure there was gas in her car, etc. All the things a loving husband should do. That's exactly what happened on that fateful morning almost two weeks ago. Carly walked into our bedroom, still breathing heavily, and fell onto the bed next to me. Although I seemed to be sleeping, I was not. She poked me gently to see if I was asleep. Before her fingers touched me, I turned around and pulled her towards me for a long, tender kiss. She smelled wonderful. This should have alerted me, but it didn't. I knew you were pretending. Pretender, she laughed. I pulled out a tray next to the bed with her coffee and donuts and one red rose flower for her. I saw a tear begin to form in the corner of her eye. I don't really understand because I did things like this for her all the time, but she feels like it's the first time every time I do it. I will never understand woman. Coffee, donuts, and a rose, she said, holding her chin like one of those detectives from cheap TV shows. I think I have solved this case, she continued, speaking as if someone other than me was listening to her. It appears that my powers of deduction are experienced and brilliant, she said pausing for dramatic effect, and then looking at me suspiciously. Word is that someone here is not satisfied with riding me like a pony for half of last night. The culprit, over coffee, donuts, and an innocent-looking rose, obviously wants some morning sex, she said the last three words with desire.
Needless to say, we were both late for work that morning, and many mornings, in fact. So, I really believed that everything was fine between us. At that moment, I would have given my life for her without hesitation. How quickly things can change. On that average evening, as I walked into the house and changed into my running gear, I kissed Carly while she mopped the kitchen floor. This was a sure sign that we were expecting someone for dinner. As I kissed her, I noticed a light layer of sweat on Carly's forehead from the effort of mopping the floor. I didn't even think about it at the time, but the seed was planted in my mind. Don't be late. I need you to get to the grill, she said, trading my quick kiss for a much more passionate peck on the lips. As we kissed, Carly's hands went into my shorts. Carly, if you keep doing this, I'll never get out of here, I said, smiling. I have something down here that you came out of this morning that needs to be filled with you, Carly said as I pulled away from her. I'll fill it up when I get back. I chuckled, one more kiss, and I was out the door. A little later, about a mile into my race, I was ecstatic. I had Evanescence playing on my iPod, I was doing what I loved, and the world was a beautiful place. Then it happened. One of those seemingly random actions. A bead of sweat rolled from my forehead into my eye, forcing me to wipe my eye. It also made me think about previous events. Something was wrong with Carly. Why did she smell so fresh after returning from a morning four-mile run and then sweat doing a little cleaning? Something wasn't adding up, but I couldn't figure out what it was. Our dinner guest turned out to be one half of one of the couples we hung out with in our area. It was the older couple, Georgette and Tom. Georgette was here alone because they were getting a divorce. Carly invited her in to provide support and essentially listen, and I was included in the plans. After I cooked the steaks, we sat down, and Georgette started complaining about how Tom had sex with his secretary and had just run off to Mexico with her. I excused myself and went into the garage to work on my favorite toy. I was preparing my Aero 6 Mustang GT for the Woodward Dream Cruise. I installed billet grills to make it look a little different, although with its shaker intake system, it was already unique enough. I really should have paid more attention to Georgette, but at that moment I did not realize that her experience could be useful to me. The next day, Thursday, Carly didn't have to run, so she woke me up with sex that I still feel almost two weeks later. That should put you off even looking at your damn secretary, she said with a grin. Carly rolled over and hugged me tightly and we stayed like that for a while. Please don't ever cheat on me, she said quietly. I promise I never will, I said, and I meant it. Sometimes I just didn't understand Carly. I loved her with all my heart and soul and after eight years of marriage, we were still having sex socially a couple of times a day, who in their right mind would want to ruin this. Women are strange creatures. That evening, when I was out for a run and turned the corner in the park, I saw the familiar figure of a man I did not know. I know it sounds absurd, but it was true. The figure was familiar because I had seen it many times before, but we never talked, so I didn't really know her. Hi, I said, slowing down to match her pace. Why are you here today? I asked. She was a little wary, which was probably to be expected. After all, she was a woman running alone, and I was the strange guy approaching her. I'm Robbie, I said. Apparently, my statement of identification had no effect. Carly must not have talked about me very often when they were running. Carly's husband, I said, as if that should clear everything up. She still looked puzzled, but she smiled, and her smile was something magnificent. It wasn't a 10-megawatt smile, all teeth, designed to calm thousands of people, like my Carly's. No, it was a subtle, toothless smile that included her beautiful green eyes and even her nose, meant exclusively for one person, and that person was me. Even though I was madly in love with my wife at that moment, that smile gave me pause. Damn, she more than made me think. That smile almost cost me a concussion. Her smile made me oblivious to where we were running, and if she hadn't grabbed my arm and pulled me away, I would have crashed straight into a tree. Who is Carly? She asked, barely holding back her laughter. Now it was my turn to be surprised. How could she not know who Carly was? She runs with you in the morning, I said. 
No, we don't have Carly, she replied. But I've seen you here many times and wanted to talk to you, she continued. My name is Rebecca. Everyone calls me Becca, she said, holding out her small hand to me. I heard you run marathons and I want to increase my distance because I've been thinking about running one, but I don't know where to start, she said. Well, I could help you with that, I offered. And over the next few miles we talked at about the types of training runs she would need. We talked about long runs, recovery runs, pacing, and the importance of choosing the right run. We even started talking about doing long runs on weekends together. I told her how some people like to make them on Saturday, and she quickly said, Sunday is better. Why do you have a hot date on Saturday morning? I joked. Something like that, she said, punctuating it with another one of those amazing smiles. She then left the treadmill, promising to meet me there on Sunday morning at dawn. As I completed my run, a thousand little thoughts were running through my head at once. The first one was, where the hell does Carly go every other day if she's not running around with Becca and her group? My thoughts were far from sex that night as my loving wife did her best to kill me with pleasure. Then she rolled over and pressed herself against me. Robbie, it's time, she said in a sleepy voice. This is our last week, she continued. Okay, I muttered, pretending to be asleep. We'll talk about this tomorrow, sleepyhead, she said. The next morning, while Carly was getting dressed to go for a run, I stayed in bed as usual. As soon as she left, I got dressed as usual. I got into the car as usual, but a little earlier. This time I followed Carly. I wasn't surprised to see her drive past the park. I stayed about a block away so she wouldn't see me, and saw her turn and park in the lot next to some really crappy apartments. It's a good thing I wasn't in my Mustang because it would have stuck out there like a sore thumb. This place was only half a step above the trailer park. I saw Carly walk up to the door of one of the apartments and knock. The door was open and Carly walked inside. Her ease showed me that this was not the first time she had done this. I crept up to the apartment and looked to see if anyone was looking outside. There was no one. All three windows were covered with those cheap blinds. None of the blinds were even closed. I looked through the first window and saw a living room with no one in it. The view from the second window changed my life forever. There was Carly taking off her running shorts while some guy with a mullet was getting comfortable. Luckily, I was sane enough to take out my iPhone and start filming videos. Carly did a little sexy dance, then climbed onto the bed and sat on the guy. He started having sex. They had a conversation during sex. I couldn't hear any sound on my video because of the window, and it didn't matter because I didn't want to hear anything they were saying. If I was expecting something hot and crazy like Carly and I having sex, I was shocked because Carly was just going through the motions. She looked bored. I wondered why she would ruin our marriage for such casual sex. My heart literally hurt. I thought about going in and wondered what I would do or tell them that would make a difference. I drove home quickly changed for work, and left before Carly got back. When I arrived at work earlier than usual, I told Crystal, my secretary, that I had been called early due to an emergency and that I would be in the office, on call most of the morning. I knew that when Carly called, I would justify myself by not talking to her directly. Like clockwork, at 7.04 am, I saw my iPhone display light up with a photo of Carly. I let it go to voicemail. Then I saw the light on the office phone turn on, and a few seconds later, Crystal poked her head in the door. I shook my head in refusal. She whispered, It's Carly. And I shook my head even more. Crystal retreated to the outer office. I could tell Crystal was wondering what was going on because I never screened Carly's calls. Ever. Even if we had very rare quarrels, we always talked to each other. At first I thought I was a genius, but if I'm such a genius, why is my wife having sex with Joe Dirt? When I thought about it more, I realized it was a mistake. I had to be very careful with everything I did until I figured it out. My only advantage was that I knew, and she didn't know that I knew. Maybe she was going to tell me. Perhaps this was what she was talking about last night. Her exact words were, The time has come, and we have about a week left. Okay, stupid, I thought. 
I don't need a week. If she needs a week, I can do it in three days. I called John Berman. John was an old friend from college and before. He was an excellent lawyer and most recently worked for Adam, American Divorce Association for Men. They specialized in ensuring that men were treated fairly in divorce cases. Hi, John, I said into the phone. Robbie, how are you? He answered. Low and to the side. My cheerful answer hid my true feelings. John, this is not a social call, I said. Do you have a friend who wants a divorce? He asked. Yes, I am, I replied. Okay, tell me another one, he laughed. John, I'm serious. Carly is cheating on me with some trashy redneck, I said. John's demeanor completely changed, and he became very serious and professional. Robbie, you're going to need evidence that we can present in court or use to our advantage. I have a great private investigation firm on board, he told me. They won't need you near the computer, John? I asked. Of course, he replied. Give me your email address, I said. I downloaded the video from my phone to the office computer and sent it to the email address John provided. Damn, Robbie, I'm so sorry. I thought you were joking, he said. John, I need the divorce papers ready to be filed in three days, I told him. Monday morning at 7 to you for sure. Wow, you're not kidding me, he said. No, that's Carly's job, I replied. Well, you don't have kids. You still keep separate bank accounts, he muttered. The house was yours when you met, he added. Okay, I'll have to work overtime, but I can do it, he said confidently. Thank you, John. You saved my life, I said. Robbie, are you sure you want this? I mean, you and Carly are the happiest couple I know, he said. Maybe she had no control over the situation. Maybe it was an isolated incident. Bye, John. Call me on my cell if you have any problems, I said, before hanging up. I then called the lock replacement service and got a quote for changing the locks. When I told the guy I needed to change both locks on my house at 6 a.m. on Monday morning, he froze. I got the impression that he thought I was going to do something illegal, so I explained the situation to him and told him that I would have ID and documents to prove that I was the owner of the house. It looks like he also got burned by something similar, because not only did he agree to do it, but he also agreed to do it for free. Then I thought about calling a moving company and packing her things neatly into boxes waiting for her in the front yard. My second thought was, screw her. Let her wait until the court orders me to give her access to the house so she can come and get her things. My third thought was to throw all her crap out onto the lawn and turn on the sprinklers. Then all our nosy neighbors could watch and come over to find out how this traitor got into this situation. I decided to go with the first option. It was the most professional, and I really didn't want revenge against Carly or her lover Lil Abner. I just wanted my heart to stop hurting and for this to all end. But one thing was for sure. I would never get involved in a relationship with a woman again for the rest of my life. I will stick to easy relationships. I've always preferred to pay up front rather than pay for it later. By lunchtime, Carly had called my cell phone 18 times and left four messages for Crystal. I don't think Crystal or I were surprised when she came to pick me up for lunch. The big surprise was when I wasn't there. But his car is still in the parking lot, Carly said. They all drove off in Dave's new SUV, Crystal said with a very serious face. I have to give Crystal credit. She may not have known what was going on, but she knew whose side her bread and butter was on. I knew I would have to talk to her eventually, but I was hoping to put it off as long as possible. I also planned to work late that night. John called me back, he wanted to discuss the details, and he told me that his private investigation agency had earned its money. From the iPhone video, they were able to get the address of the apartment, and from there, the guy's name, and the fact that he was married. How will this help me, John? I asked. The most peaceful people can sometimes be the craziest when it comes to legal matters, John said. You're asking for an amicable, no-contest divorce. What's yours stays yours, what's hers stays hers, right? But that's fine until she starts crying, doing all those girly things, claiming you abused her or neglected her, and basically forced her to cheat as the only way to get her emotional needs met. Then she asks for counseling to try to save the marriage, 
and then you're trapped because you might end up in months of counseling, listening to this stupid bitch talking about how she tried to justify cheating, and the counselor will adore her for opening up and expressing her feelings because it makes him seem like he's doing his damn job. The court may end up giving her a better deal division of assets. She most likely won't get your house because it was yours before you met, but any assets acquired during the marriage can be divided down the middle, he explained. That's fine by me, I said. I just want her to go away. Oh, really, John said. So would you be pleased to see her trailer park boyfriend cram his mullet into your Mustang? Hell no. I'd kill them both, I replied sharply. So we need to be ready to bring out the big guns if she forces us. Just leave it to me. It's my job, he said, and then hung up. Since I knew Carly would be home soon, I called and left a message on the home phone that I would be back very late because we were having problems at work. I called my home phone instead of her cell phone because I didn't want to talk to her. I tried very hard to make my voice normal. We think stupid things at the strangest moments. While I was leaving the message, Carly's words from the previous night came back to me. Please don't ever cheat on me, she said. Maybe I should have asked her the same thing, but then it would have been too late. After work, I went to a club with some guys. We stayed there until most of them decided it was time to go home since they were still married. I wondered how many of them had been subjected to the same treatment as me. I walked into my house at the extremely late hour of 7.15 p.m. The sun hasn't even set yet. Carly made a full range of complaints about me not calling her back, where I was, etc. She tried to hug me, but I pulled away. I then reminded her that I should have been in the garage getting my car ready for the dream cruise the next day. I haven't seen you all day, and the first thing you mention is the car, she complained. You don't love me anymore, she said jokingly. She had no idea how prophetic her words were. Of course I do, I lied. It's just been a really long and shitty day. I have to leave really early in the morning and I'll be there all day, I said. So, I continued, I really need to wash and polish the car now. Okay, honey, she said. I'll make us a quick dinner after you're done and then you can bathe in front of me, she said with a wink. There was no chance that I would find myself in her arms again. Is she a sex addict or something? I stayed in the garage late into the night, and luckily, Carly was already asleep when I walked into the house. I set the alarm on my watch to wake up after only five hours of sleep and crawled into bed as far away from her as the size of our bed would allow. That morning, I left again before she woke up, and in an act of genius, I left my iPhone on the nightstand next to our bed with a word processor open on the screen. When she notices the phone, it will look like I started writing her a sweet message telling her how much I love her. I knew she would read it but wouldn't tell me about it. She wouldn't want me to think she was invading my privacy by reading the letter I wrote to her. At the same time, since I clearly forgot my phone, she would have no way to contact me and vice versa. It would also hopefully delay her realizing that something was wrong between us. When I arrived at the event, another one of those seemingly random things happened. The Dream Cruise became an event that took on a life of its own. It was originally a one-day celebration of classic cars and hot rods. It now features cars of all eras and styles, circling the city's central boulevard from the small suburb of Ferndale, Michigan, to Pontiac, Michigan. Although strange, the event is largely considered a Detroit affair. It starts outside of Detroit and never enters the city itself. You could almost call it a cruise away from Detroit, because that's exactly what it does. There are also many cruise events now available. Many of the participating cities host their own parties, events, exhibitions, etc. Some stay true to the original 50s theme, while others celebrate different aspects of automotive history or even one make of car. So, for example, the event I went to, Mustang Alley, in Ferndale. Every year during the Dream Cruise, the city of Ferndale celebrates all things Mustang. There are Mustangs of all eras and models on display along the Nine Mile Road course, which has been limited to 600 cars in recent years. 
Yes, it is a paradise for car lovers, and especially for Mustang fans. Thousands of people are represented as they walk by, photograph, and discuss the cars, admiring and studying them. As I parked somewhere in the middle, I noticed a now familiar pair of legs. Their owner bent over, and her legs ended in a beautiful heart-shaped butt that I had not noticed before. I hadn't even started polishing my car before I walked over to talk to the feet and their owner. So this is your hot date, I said. Becca quickly straightened up and gave me one of those smiles. So you're here helping your boyfriend with his car, I asked. You must love him very much to do this, I continued, delving deeper into my misunderstanding. Well, she said, I don't have a boyfriend. This is my car. Very beautiful, I said, even more impressed. Let's see. It's an 009 V6 Vert with a custom dual exhaust system. Mac performance exhaust system, right? I continued. Oh, hi. T's 18-inch triple chrome wheels with Hankook tires, I said. Very impressive, she said. You really know your Mustangs. How did you know it was a V6 and not a GT? She asked. And how did you know it was 09? She added, not allowing me to answer the first question. Your rear bumper is straight and doesn't have the cutouts for the dual exhaust system that all 1999 to 2004 models have, I began. That means you added the dual exhaust system yourself, I continued. All GTs from the factory come with a dual exhaust system. You also don't have fog lights. Another sign of the V6. Anniversary fender badges only come out every five years, and your car couldn't have been an 004. It's the wrong body. And since it's a 14 still only in the dreams of designers, it should have been 09, I finished, bowing. So why are you here, and where's what's her name? She asked. Sorry, but I can't remember your wife's name. This is Carly, I replied, and in a couple of days she will be my ex-wife. This cooled our conversation a little, and the day could have gone exactly like this if fate had not intervened. Robbie, I have a problem, said a voice behind me. I turned around and saw Becca. This woman knew how to dress. She was just wearing a t-shirt and shorts that weren't even too short. Her shorts went up to about three inches above the knee, but her calf muscles and visible thighs were spectacular. The t-shirt, covering her from the neck to the beginning of the shorts, only emphasized her breasts. Her hair wasn't even styled in a particularly feminine style. She didn't even try to look good, and still left far behind all the auto show models. Oh my God, this is wonderful. What kind of car is this? She asked. 06 GT with shaker hood in screaming yellow with black racing stripes, I said. If this is your soon-to-be ex-wife's car, you'd have to love her very much to do that, she mockingly commented. Then, seeing my reaction, she realized she had said something wrong and reached out to comfort me. That first touch was like an electric shock, and all thoughts of my cheating bitch ex-wife disappeared. I'm really sorry, forgive me, she said in a low voice. So what's the problem, Becca? I asked. What did you bring for lunch? She asked. I was confused and felt a little stupid because I hadn't brought anything and it had been a long, hot day. There's a McDonald's up the street, I suggested. So you're going to run back and forth to McDonald's all day when your neighbor across the street and friend brought a gourmet lunch and a trunk full of healthy food and snacks? She asked. When you say it like that, I started. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Why would you do that when I'm willing to share? She asked. Women always want something in return when they offer to share, I said quietly. Then louder, adding, Whatever you need, Becca, if I have it, it's yours. Just? She asked. Just like that, I replied. I was so busy packing food that I forgot all my car care products, she said. I need quick polish spray, chrome polish, tire gel, and glass cleaner. I went to my trunk and gave her everything she asked for. She had never used tire gel pads before, so I showed her how to use them, and she was amazed at the shine they gave to her tires. And also, this way you waste less product, I told her. We spent the rest of the day sitting in my car or hers, talking. I don't remember how many people came up or even if anyone came up at all. We laughed and ate and talked about everything from running to cars to my upcoming divorce. 
she understood more than I gave her credit for, because she had gone through exactly the same thing four years ago. That's why she didn't have a boyfriend. She didn't want to repeat it either. When it was time to leave, I didn't want the day to end. I started asking her for dinner, but I thought it would be inappropriate given the circumstances. So we said goodbye. Were my eyes deceiving me? Or did she smile a little wider when she said, See you in the morning? When I arrived home, Carly was waiting for me. It was only 6 p.m., but she was already dressed for bed. Or rather, undressed for sleep. She was wearing a soft purple negligee that I had never seen before. She prepared another of her romantic little dinners, a stir-fry with pieces of steak and chicken and assorted vegetables. Usually when she cooked something like this, we would feed each other, and this intimate act would lead to further intimacy in the bedroom. Carly, I love you so much, I lied, but I don't feel good. I'm tired and I think I'm getting sick, I said. If you have it, then I'll get it too, she said. I was actually more worried about getting an infection from her, but I wisely didn't voice it. Well, this is a good time for us to talk, she said. This is a serious question, I asked. Very serious, she replied. Is it urgent? Do we need to make a decision right now? I asked. Why do you ask? She asked. Well, I have a really long run tomorrow morning, and I'm thinking maybe, if possible, I'll put it off until Monday night, I explained. This way, all my work at work will be completed. My longest run of the week is behind me, and I can fully concentrate on what you have to say. Carly seemed to consider what I said, and then agreed. Okay. It's nothing that can't wait another day. When we talk about it, I think you'll be surprised because it will change our lives, she said. She, I hope you're okay with this because I really want us to do this, she added. Oh yeah, bitch, but I'll beat you to it, I thought, because I was now sure that she was going to leave me for that damn trailer park guy she was sleeping with. I wondered what made him so much better than me. It couldn't have just been sex, because looking at them, it wasn't nearly as intense as what we were doing. It just looked like two people having sex out of boredom. She did not give him pleasure and did not even have sex in her favorite position. What could be attractive? But then I realized that I was the one who didn't know. Perhaps what she was getting from Jethro was the kind of sex she wanted. And if so, then I was happy to get rid of that bitch. I swore that when this was over, I would never allow any woman to come so close to my heart and my feelings again. In the back of my mind, I wondered why, if I really meant it, I was already thinking about Becca. Sunday found me in a more relaxed mood. I woke up before the sun and, for the first time in years, was excited about the hard, long run ahead. One night, Carly rolled over to me and wrapped her arms and legs around me, as if she was holding on to me like a life preserver. She really had no idea how true that statement was. The only thought that went through my mind was how I could avoid her for one more day. Just the sight of her conjured up images in my mind of her having sex with Barney Fife. I carefully freed myself from her embrace and got out of bed. It's amazing how quickly human emotions can change. Just two days ago, I was so in love with this woman that I would gladly give my life for her. I really couldn't imagine my future without her. Now she was just another available girl to me. I knew that these thoughts were fueled by anger and that before the end of this situation, I would experience many more stages and different emotions. But for now, as long as I could clearly see the pain that had been caused to me, I needed to be free. I got dressed and microwaved some pizza a couple days ago for a quick pre-run snack. I took the refrigerator and filled it with bottles of Snapple, Pepsi, Gatorade, and, ugh, water. I put some fruit, granola bars, and some pretzels in my bag and left the house. It's funny, but when I walked up to the door, I saw almost the same things packed and waiting for me with a note from Carly. The note said, Be careful. It's going to be very hot outside today. Please don't kill yourself over one race because someone loves you and can't live without you. With the caption, Forever yours, Carly. After reading the note from Carly, I suddenly ran to the car and got into it. I drove my Taurus today because I didn't want to risk the Mustang getting sweetie. 
As soon as I closed the door, I let out the laugh I had been holding in since I read the note. Oh yes, she loved me so much that she had fun with some jabroni three times a week. Forever now also has a different meaning. Forever it was just over 24 hours. When I arrived at the park, it was just beginning to get light. I immediately noticed Becky's Mustang and her sitting on it. She didn't even look at me when I approached her. I parked next to her and noticed that she seemed more and more attractive every time I saw her. When I got out of the car, she recognized me and her face lit up. I was looking for a yellow stang, she said with a smile. I don't want him to sweat, I answered with a smile. A guy who spoils his car will probably spoil his women, she laughed. There was that awkward moment of silence again when she realized what she had said. She opened her mouth and began making strange movements with her hands. What are you doing? I asked. There was amusement in my voice. I'm trying to get my foot out of my mouth, she laughed. That was enough. Our growing chemistry began to intensify again. We started running at a very easy pace. Luckily for us, the park was a simple oval track about three miles long. My goal for the day was 22 miles, and hers was 14 which was the longest run she had done so far, with a maximum of 10 miles. We'll both feel broken after this. A couple of miles after we started, the sun rose and gave us a beautiful view. It wasn't high enough in the sky yet to start frying, but the light and light show were beautiful. I must have seen this same scene hundreds of times in this same park, but today was the first time I really noticed its beauty. It must be the company, I muttered. What? Becca said. I just thought I'd seen the sunrise literally hundreds of times, but never really noticed how magnificent it was. I attribute this revelation to the company, I said in a quieter voice. I like you too, she said seriously. I just don't understand, she continued. You seem like such a nice guy. Why are you getting a divorce? Carly, I started. She cheated on me. Unlike our conversation on Saturday, I didn't hold anything back. I told her the whole situation during our run, including her role in uncovering Carly's deception. What a stupid bitch, she blurted. Sorry, she said. It just came out. Suddenly I looked at the lap counter on my watch. Becca, you should take a walk to cool down, I told her. Oh, trying to get rid of me? I'm sorry for calling your wife a bitch, but if the asshole I married was half as nice as you, we'd still be married. Nothing would tear us apart. She said decisively, Becca, I'm not trying to get rid of you, I said, pointing at my watch. We just ran 16 miles. Oh, she said. I'm sure you have things to do today, I said. It was a great run and I left the trunk open. There are drinks and snacks in there, so you should grab something and start recovering as soon as you can. I said. Becca slowed down and crossed the infield past the tennis courts. It was a faster route back to the cars. When I finished that loop, I still had five miles to go, and I noticed that Becky's car was gone. I finished my miles and was so exhausted that I barely made it to my car. I took a Pepsi out of the trunk and noticed that my refrigerator was missing. In its place was a note that read, Picnic area, large oak tree. I was too tired to walk, so I drove the half mile to the picnic area. It couldn't be seen from the road, so you had to know where it was. Becky's car was there and my refrigerator. Suddenly, I could walk comfortably again. I don't know how she did it or where she got the paper plates and stuff, but Becca turned my fruit and snacks into a cute little breakfast. She stood at the picnic table in the shade of a tree, doing post-run stretches. I could stand there and look at her for hours while my legs cramped and not say a word. There you are, she said, breaking the silence. Did you miss me? I thought you went home, I said. I was so tired I could hit you, she said, but I wasn't ready for it to end yet. I walked over to the table and picked up Snapple, continuing to look around. What are you looking for? Becca asked taking a long sip of my Pepsi. Oh my God, was this for you? I thought you somehow found out about my crazy love for Pepsi and brought it for me. She laughed. We spent a couple more hours there, discussing everything we could think of before heating home. 
When I got home, Carly was waiting for me as usual. She seemed very skilled at feigning concern. Maybe she really was worried. I've heard that some people can love two partners at the same time, but in different ways. Hell, I loved both of my cars, but to be honest, not equally. I wondered what my feelings for Carly were. Did she love me and just have sex with Mr. Haney for the thrill? Or did she really love him, but knew she would never be happy with the lifestyle he had to offer her? So she lived with me, pretending to be content, and gave me sex as a consolation to keep me around. Why have you been missing for so long? She asked. I think I pulled something, I lied. It hurt a lot, but I had to finish. So you just kept running even when you were hurting, probably making the injury worse, she said. She was either an Oscar-worthy actress or truly troubled. In any case, I found my way out. She filled the bathtub with warm, soapy water for me and gave me Tylenol for the pain. I was going to ask you to come with me to my mom's for a while today, but I'll call her back and tell her we'll come next week, she said. Why don't you go? I'll probably just sleep most of the day. You can meet her and you won't have to wait until tomorrow. You'll usually be home in about an hour, I said, and then realized that I had almost given myself away. I mean, you don't have to wait until next week, I quickly corrected myself, trying to correct my mistake. No, I should stay with you, she said, looking at me suspiciously. Carly, let's go, I said firmly. I really believed she was going to have sex with Goober, but I didn't care where she went or how long she stayed as long as she was back here by seven tomorrow to get her divorce papers. I was still trying to decide if I wanted to be here or not. I took a long bath to recover from my long run. Then I actually went to bed and tried to sleep, but I was too excited. My thoughts were about Becca, and not all of them were pure ones. What was the difference, I asked myself, between what Carly was doing and what I thought I was doing? The only difference I could see was that Carly did it. I didn't even consider it or anything like it until I realized there was no way I could go back to my old life with Carly. As I closed my eyes, my head was filled with visions of Carly and Gomer Pyle having sex next to me on the bed. They were so quiet and boring that I didn't wake up, and then she told me that we were going to have a baby. But she smiled when she said it, so I knew it wasn't my child. When the child was born, he appeared wearing a straw hat and chewing a stalk of hay. I finally fell asleep, so I don't know what time Carly got back. She may have only been gone for an hour or two, or she may have been out all night. Although I doubted it because there was food on the nightstand, and Carly didn't eat after 8 gamma p.m. There was also a book open on the table, which meant Carly had spent another night without sex, so she was probably ready to head to the trailer park with her true love, Sam Drucker. I looked at the glow-in-the-dark alarm clock face and counted down the seconds until the alarm sounded, ending my marriage. It's not too late, I told myself. You can still cancel this. Carly wrapped her arms around me again, as if I really meant something to her. Maybe I should have bought a cowboy hat. Her actions aside, lying here with a woman who seemed to worship me felt so good, especially when she was just bending over me taking what must have been an awkward position just to be closer to me. Then the alarm went off and I felt the tension run through Carly's body. I decided that Carly's actions would determine the game. If Carly doesn't leave today, I'll still confront her about it. But I'll try to save our marriage. But if she leaves, everything will end between us. I will not influence her decision in one direction or another. It will be her choice. She will have to choose between us, me or him. Carly started to stand up. I don't know why, but I had tears in my eyes, and I basically threw my own rules out the window. Why don't you stay home today? I asked, so much for not trying to get her to stay. Maybe next time, honey, she said, kissing me. But today, I really have to go. One run more or less won't kill you, I replied sharply. This one is very important, she said. It's just something I need to do. And so, as they say, the die was thrown. Watching Carly get dressed for the last time really made me sad. Sure, she put on a few extra pounds, even over the past year. While she was running three times a week, she still gained weight. 
but I didn't care. Until three days ago, she was still the sexiest thing in my universe, and I really missed what we had, even if it was a lie. Do you feel better? She asked, kissing me lightly on the cheek. Physically, probably, I muttered. That's what I need. When I get back, take off your clothes and be ready for me, she said with a smile. And don't forget, we have a conversation tonight, she said more seriously. As soon as Carly's car drove away, the trucks pulled up and John's Lexus pulled up. I opened the door and the men began to enter the house while I was getting dressed. One guy started working on the front door while the other started working on the back door. Besides John and me, there were only six men in the house. Somehow, I expected more. They quickly packed everything that even remotely resembled a woman, including all of her toiletries and bath accessories, into very nice boxes and labeled them so that almost any item could be easily found. They left about 10% of the boxes on the front porch and loaded the rest into a large truck that followed Carly wherever she wanted, even unloading it for her. I tried to be as nice as possible for the first seven years when we were truly happy. I couldn't help but cry as I took it all in. They finished in less than 30 minutes. John introduced me to the bailiff, who was to serve the document itself. I shook his hand and ran to my car. I quickly went through my usual route and bought Carly her favorite coffee and donuts one last time. I got back by 6.55 got new keys to the doors, and watched as everyone except the driver and loader of the remaining truck drove away. John told me that everything, including the restraining order for the building where I work, was in effect. Because of his former friendship with Carly, he didn't want to be here, and neither did I. As we drove off in different directions, I saw Carly's car pull into the yard. I don't know why, but I stopped halfway down the street to look. I saw her walk up onto the porch, she looked really happy, and why not? She had just returned from trying to punch Fred Ziffel's bed through his floor and was expecting to give me another merciless fuck. I saw her trying to open the door, but she didn't seem to notice the boxes yet. I saw the bailiff approach her. They talked briefly, he handed her the envelope, and she screamed so loudly that I heard her almost halfway down the street. Carly fell to her knees and just sat there. I left. I would like to say that after seeing her reaction, all my pain went away or I felt better, but that's not the case. But it took the edge off the pain at least a little and put me on the path to overcoming it. The next few days with Becca really helped ease the pain. I have often heard that love cannot be turned off like a switch, but it seems that when you replace a bad love with a much better one, miracles can happen. Barley it's been 24 hours since I received the biggest shock of my life. My significant other, the love of my life, was divorcing me. Although he kicked me out of the house, Robbie did it as gently as possible. This told me that he still loved me. But for some reason, he decided that we could not continue. After I finished crying, I asked the truck driver to take me to my mother. I had just been to her the day before to share other news, so this will come as a bit of a shock to her. I didn't unpack my things because deep down, I didn't intend to stay here long enough for me to need them. I saw that John Berman was Robbie's lawyer and called him. Hi, John, I said into the phone, fighting back tears. Carly, he asked carefully. Yes, I said. Carly, we shouldn't talk without your lawyer present, he said. I don't have it, I cried. Well, speaking as your friend, you should really find him, he replied. Why, John? I don't want a lawyer, I don't want a divorce, I just want Robbie, I cried. Tell him that I will do whatever he wants. I don't understand why this is happening, I love him so much. Carly, if you can get a lawyer, we can set up a meeting to discuss this. Robbie is trying very hard to be extremely fair with you, he stressed. He wants it to be an amicable divorce, you get to keep all your stuff and he gets to keep all his. The only thing I want to keep is my husband, I said with tears. He only wants the house and his Mustang. You can take everything else, including all the furniture. Plus, even though you bought your car together, he wants you to keep it, he said. Why is he doing this? I screamed. Carly, get a lawyer and we can set up a meeting, he said. Okay, I'll have a lawyer in an hour, I told him. We'll make an appointment for 9 a.m. tomorrow at my office. 
he said and hung up. The first thing that came to my mind was that someone was forcing Robbie to divorce me. Then I thought about it and remembered that he had been acting weird, and we hadn't had sex since Thursday morning. I know it was only a few days, but we got used to it several times a day. Even after eight years, we were still like newlyweds. I craved his touch. The sight of him was enough to turn me on, and I would never give in without him. This made me cry again, and I thought about it even more. And I was sure that I had found the answer. If I was right, I could easily get Robbie back. I would just have to give up what I thought I wanted. But now, in perspective, it didn't seem that important. And the time was just right. I mentioned this to Robbie on Thursday or Friday, and I'm sure he now knew and wasn't happy about the idea. This would be a major change in our lifestyle, and he may not be ready for it yet. I was, but without him, no matter how much pleasure it gave me. It just wasn't worth it. Of course, if he agreed to it, like some men, that would be great. Robbie probably wasn't that type of man. I took out the telephone directory and simply called the first lawyer on the list. We talked for about an hour and a half. He asked me to read him some paragraphs from the divorce papers and said he needed a copy of them. He told me that it looked like I was being dumped for another woman and I could probably get more out of it. I told him I didn't want more. I wanted Robbie back. I told him what I wanted to discuss with Robbie, and he said that many men are simply not ready for this yet, and if this is so, then pointing out irreconcilable differences would be a good reason, and the agreement was indeed fair. We should have just gone to the meeting and talked to them. We could plan our strategy after that. He asked me if there were other reasons why Robbie might want a divorce, and I really couldn't think of any. And here I am, sitting at the table, 24 hours later waiting for John and Robbie. My lawyer looks a little young, but I don't care. He's only here to let me into the meeting so I can talk to Robbie. There will be no divorce. I will die earlier. Or if Robbie got himself some bitch, she'll die. Just because I've gained a little weight, there's no reason to throw our marriage into the trash. John walked in, followed by my husband. Robbie looked really good today. I smiled when I saw him, but he didn't smile back. In fact, he looked away from me, and I could see the pain in his eyes. That look in his eyes, like I'd done something bad to him, really hurt me, and I couldn't stand it. So I just blurted out, Okay, Robbie, if you don't want to have kids with me, I'll forget about all this. Let's just go home. Robbie looked shocked, and so did John. They had no idea what I was talking about. Carly, what are you talking about? Robbie asked very gently. I know you understood that I was going to tell you that I want to have your children, and you are not ready to be a father yet. Perhaps never, I said. So you just decided that since I want kids and you don't, we should get a divorce so we can each have what we want. But Robbie, I love you. He snorted when I said that. I love only you, and without you, I have no life. So we are not obliged to have children now or ever, I said sadly. For a while, silence reigned in the room. The silence in the air was almost palpable. Robbie then walked over to the TV at the end of the table and turned it on. I was hoping I wouldn't have to do this, he said softly. I was only going to do it if this whole thing turned into trouble. I noticed that he was holding back tears as he spoke, and my heart broke again. Carly, I would love to have kids with you. I couldn't think of anything better until Friday morning, he said, holding back tears. Then, Robbie, why can't we have them? I asked. Because I'll never know who they are, and I can't share with you, Carly. We need a divorce, he said. Robbie pressed the TV remote control, and I saw the video begin. It was so strange to see myself on screen. Seeing yourself on video is a strange experience. You don't look the way you see yourself in the mirror. The first thing I thought was that I looked a little plumper than I thought. As I watched the video, I recognized the location and my eyes widened in horror. Oh no, I thought, please don't let it be like that. But that's how it was. My image on the screen began to take off his clothes as he walked across the room. Was my butt really that big? Mark was already lying on the bed when I approached. As I watched myself climb onto the bed, I thought, damn, my butt is huge. We started having sex. 
My lawyer looked as if this betrayal had affected him personally. I felt extremely embarrassed and ashamed. And when I saw the tears continuously flowing down Robbie's cheeks, it was as if someone had just put a vice on my chest and was squeezing the life out of me. Suddenly it became clear that I could lose him, for real and forever. Until this moment, none of this made sense. It was just a dream, a nightmare from which I had to wake up and return everything to its place, as it should be. I wasn't going to give up without a fight. Robbie, it's not what you think. I can explain. Robbie, I don't love him. I only love you, I said. Robbie just sat there with his head on the table and cried, not even looking at me. John suggested, although this was not a trial, that we take a break to discuss the situation. He left the room, taking Robbie with him. As soon as the door closed, my lawyer started yelling at me. You stupid bitch, why didn't you tell me about this? He shouted. You've already lost everything, so sign the damn papers before they change them. You were right, he really treats you well. And his lawyer is playing ball with you too. If I represented him, we would sue you for adultery and publish this video to all your friends and family. We would also sue your lover for breaking family ties, and if he was married, I would take up her case too, he said. Just sign the damn papers, he barked. But I want my husband back, I stammered. Have you ever seen people take their kids out for ice cream and get there just as the place is closing? And as soon as they leave the counter, the child drops the ice cream? That's how my lawyer looked at me. His look said, Bitch, I bought you this ice cream and you dropped it. There's nothing you can do about it, so get over it. We can offer counseling, he said, but that won't work. Obviously, like you said, he's a good guy and he loves you very much, but you just destroyed him. Any idiot can see that he loves you, but if you take him to court and he cries for you like he is now and then shows this video, you will lose everything, he barked. Besides, I'll do you one last favor. I can't keep my professional suspension on this case, so I'm leaving. That means they can't continue until you have a lawyer, and that will buy you some time, said he. I watched as he collected his briefcase and left the room. I'll bill you, was the last thing he said to me. As the door closed, I heard him say to Robbie, Sorry, man, as he walked away. Robbie and John returned to the room. I know my lawyer left, but I just have to explain this. Can we just talk? I begged. Robbie nodded his head, and I knew he just wanted to get this over with, and I'd probably never see him again if I messed this up. John said, Only if you sign a release and admit that you continued knowing you didn't have a lawyer and allow the conversation to be recorded. Whatever, I said. Robbie, I love you more than life itself, I began. But I hated running, and I just wasn't very good at it. Then I met Mark, who I knew briefly in college, and he had a lot of free time because he wasn't working. At first we would just meet and spend time together for an hour while I was supposed to be running, but since I kept coming to him in these tight workout outfits, he started making comments about how sexy I looked. I felt vulnerable because of the pounds gained, so I started to give in to it. Robbie, every day you tell me that I am beautiful and sexy. But you have to say this because you are my husband and you love me. But apparently, to hear this from someone, the other one was really flattering and I liked it. Then one thing led to another and he started touching me, which led to the first time. It was never about sex. It was just something that could take an hour, I said, realizing how stupid it sounded when I said it. Perhaps the thought of someone other than you wanting me made it exciting, I said. But this has nothing to do with love. I only love you, I said. I paused to catch my breath. The day you made that video was Friday, right? That day I told him it was over. I was tired of lying to you and we couldn't do it anymore because you and I were about to start our family. I was going to stop taking the pills and I didn't want to risk having anyone but you inside me. Then he started telling me that I would be back in a week because I would miss him and our hot sex. There why I laughed because the sex wasn't hot. Having sex with him was boring. I told him that he doesn't even compare to you and that most days when I was done with him, I couldn't wait to run home and have sex with you. He was just an appetizer to whet his appetite, Robbie. You were the main course, I said. The words sounded empty even as I spoke them. Robbie handed me the divorce papers 
and I step it back from the table. I need to ask you four questions, Robbie said. The first three are very easy. If you answer all four, I'll tear up these papers and we'll try to fix it. But if you can't answer even one of them, you have to let me go. I nodded in response. Do you love me? He asked. With all my heart and soul, I replied. Did I love you? He asked. You really seem like you did. Okay, yes, I believe you did, I said. Have I ever hit you? Treated you badly? Refused to listen to your opinion? Made it so that you couldn't come to me if something was wrong? He asked. No, none of that, I smiled. Then why was it easier for you to have sex with some farmhand behind my back for a year and ruin our marriage than to just say, Robbie, I don't like running? I didn't have an answer to this question. I just sat there but I still refused to sign those damn papers. I struggled with this for weeks, and Robbie never did anything wrong. He never posted the video online or gave copies to my friends. In fact, he never even spoke badly about me. He went to counseling, both alone and with me, but it didn't lead to anything. Month after month, our goals never came closer. I wanted our marriage back. I was ready to do anything, even live in different houses and start over. Robbie just wanted to get out. He said he couldn't look at me anymore and couldn't trust me. I showed him the lock on the chastity belt on the internet, but he just looked at me sadly. He even paid for all the counseling sessions since I had been missing so much work lately and had no money. There was no point in going there and languishing every day for nothing. I also slowly watched the light in my husband's eyes change. Where his eyes once lit up when he saw me, it was different now. When Robbie walked into a room, he was bright and happy, but as soon as he saw me, he became sad. It was as if something or someone else was making him glow, and I was just a reminder of a sad past. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore and just signed the papers. I knew that even if we were separated for some time, time would bring us together again. I finally realized that I did a very bad thing, so maybe having to be away from him for a year or so will make him see that no matter how bad I did, I will never hurt him again. And also, maybe he can see that no one can love him as much as I do. I also hoped that someday we would still be able to have our children, since we both wanted them. He said this at a meeting with lawyers. These words were the most powerful thing I took from this stupid meeting. These words were even stronger than the pain of watching myself act like a bitch on video. He said, Carly, I would love to have kids with you. And if it killed me, we'd still have them. Robbie went on a cruise alone to think about what he wanted. I hoped he would want me. Maybe six or seven months later, when I was driving past the park, I thought I saw him running. He always looked so cool, running with that easy, carefree stride that just ate up the miles. People always talk about how running is good for you. There's an old joke that if running is so beneficial, why do people look so miserable when they do it? Robbie was an exception to this rule. He had the biggest smile on his face as he ran, almost as big as the smile he had when he saw me. He walked up to his old car, a Taurus. He still refused to drive the Mustang as he ran and stopped. His depression after the end of our marriage seemed to have lifted. He obviously gave his all to running to help him get through it. I slowed down my car as I approached him because he might be ready to talk to me. I have been praying for this moment for almost a year. Then I saw where his smile was coming from. She came running down the path almost as quickly as he did, and just as gracefully. I had to admit that the bitch was beautiful. She had this crooked smile that she kept throwing at him. Damn, I wish I could hear what they had to say. He seemed to laugh at her because he had defeated her. Then she did something that hurt me more than anything in my life. She shook her head in denial, and as I watched her hair fall around her perfect face, she did it. She pointed to her belly, where her ideal tummy would be, and I noticed a small bulge that was inconsistent with the rest of her body. When I craned my neck to get a better look, I saw him patting her little belly and putting his ear to it, then kissing it. She affectionately stroked his head and kissed him. This fool was pregnant by my husband. What was the first thing that came to my mind when I saw this special and beautiful moment that was supposed to be between us? the steering wheel of my car because the airbag didn't deploy, 
and I was so busy watching them that I drove into oncoming traffic and had an accident. The truck that crashed into me didn't even have time to break. Luckily, I died instantly, without any further pain. It didn't really matter because from the moment I saw this woman pregnant with the child that was supposed to be mine, I died inside. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.